Well, first, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the annual Southern Thoracic Surgical Association meeting, which obviously is a virtual meeting this year. 2020 has been a year like no other, and all of us have had our lives dramatically impacted by COVID. Before we start, the leadership of the Southern offers our condolences to those who have lost loved ones because of COVID. And also before we start, we'd like to thank Beth, Rachel, and Laura, and our entire Southern Thoracic team for putting this together and giving us the opportunity to spend some time together. Uh, I'd now like to introduce and acknowledge our president, Vino Thirani. Uh, clearly, Vino will be formally introduced by Dan Miller next year before his presidential address. And I would just like to acknowledge that we have a president who's a great clinician, academician, researcher, teacher, and friend. And we're lucky to have Vino lead the Southern through these challenging times. And with that, I'll turn it over to Vino and he will get our 2020 meeting started. Uh, Jeff, thank you so much. And, and um, you've been incredible to work with, not only in your presidency, but also as a council chair for this year and also uh, for uh, potentially next year. So um, today, what we thought we would do in the spirit of the Southern, I know that we're so different than every other society and association that we're almost like a, um, a family. And we thought that um, I know that we're not able to be together um, during this time period, but we thought we would share with you the top three or top two adult cardiac, uh, top two thoracic and top two congenital papers that we thought were new science that we thought was just absolutely phenomenal. We thought we'd give the opportunity for um, uh, those special individuals to present um, their data in front of all of us. Um, so I'm so proud that we were able to put this together and it's really the staff of the STSA that takes all the credit and, and um, a couple of us, Joe Schmoes, were just kind of um, guiding them a little bit. Um, so a couple of um, announcements, all moderation speakers should remain muted with their video turned off during the pre-recorded presentations if they're not participating in an active discussion. If you're on a phone, please turn your computer um, speakers down and echo is created when the phone picks up computer audio. Please be mindful of the environment while your video is enabled. Um, we don't want you to be a Twitter uh, account down the, down the road or, or, or somebody, um, some untoward event. Attendees are encouraged to participate in the live discussion by utilizing, uh, utilizing the Q&A functionality. I think all of us know in now Zoom world how the Q&A works. Uh, we will be specifically having digital moder uh, moderators who are assigned to monitor these questions. The webinar is being recorded um, and you'll be able to see this at the stsa.org and CTSnet in the coming days. And then SDSA CME will not be offered in conjunction with this uh, webinar since this is not a true meeting of the Southern Thoracic. The last thing we'll say is that the SDSA members are strongly encouraged. We're gonna have a virtual SDSA business meeting on Saturday, December the 12th at 9 a.m. We, uh, we do need to have at least 50 people on this, um, on this uh, business meeting. There's some unbelievably important stuff that we'll need to discuss. So, please try to be on that. It's just going to be for 30 minutes. We really appreciate you taking Saturday morning and having coffee with the Southern um, uh, leadership. Um, so two of the other things that I want to mention to you that we've been working on a membership drive. So we really encourage you as, as members of the Southern uh, to continue to drive our membership so that we um, are able to extend our family even more. And we'll be coming out with a new committees, a new uh, uh, ad hoc committee on communications. And we'll be planning on uh, every other month or so um, newsletters about the members of the Southern Thoracic. So if you have any specific um, things you want us to cover, please email me directly. You guys know how to get in touch with me or the Southern Thoracic, you can email them and they'll also let you um, uh, get in touch with me so we can start working on that. Um, so without further ado, I think we'll go ahead and start off with the first uh, pre-recorded uh, talk. And, and this will be by our past president and council chair, uh, Jeff Jacobs. And this will be experience with 100 patients with COVID-19 and severe pulmonary compromise treated with uh, ECMO. Jeff. It is my pleasure to present our multi-institutional analysis of 100 consecutive patients with COVID-19 and severe pulmonary compromise treated with ECMO. Our disclosures are shown on this slide. All of us 
have had our very existence impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Indeed, life as we know it has changed dramatically, stunningly, rapidly, and globally. The evolution of the treatment of patients with COVID-19 is unlike any event ever seen in medicine. As of October 24, 2020, 42,299,535 patients around the world have been diagnosed with COVID-19 with over 1 million associated deaths, calculating to a 2.71% mortality rate worldwide. Meanwhile, in the United States of America, as of October 24, 2020, over 8 million patients have been diagnosed with COVID-19, corresponding to over 200,000 associated deaths and a corresponding mortality rate of 2.64%. The purpose of this manuscript is to review our multi-institutional clinical experience in 100 consecutive patients with confirmed COVID-19 and severe pulmonary compromise supported with ECMO at 20 hospitals and to document outcomes and trends in management over time. A multi-institutional database was created and utilized to assess all patients with confirmed COVID-19 who were supported with ECMO at these 20 hospitals. This database is a component of the Specialty Care Scope database. Statistical methodology is shown on this slide. This figure depicts the distribution of all 100 patients by category of outcome. 42 patients died on ECMO or within 24 hours of decannulation. Eight more patients died beyond 24 hours after decannulation, but prior to hospital discharge. And 50 patients currently survive with 49 discharged from the ECMO providing hospital and one still in the ECMO providing hospital. Mean and median age of all patients was 50 and 51 years respectively. Two-thirds were men. Survivors were younger than non-survivors, with a median age of 47 years in survivors and 57 years in non-survivors. This graph depicts the distribution of the age of the patients, comparing the survivors with the non-survivors. Again, survivors were younger than non-survivors. One or more pre-COVID comorbid condition was present in 80 out of 100 patients, including obesity in 57, hypertension in 39, diabetes in 37, and asthma in 20. No difference in pre-COVID comorbid conditions were present in survivors versus non-survivors. Mean and median time from COVID diagnosis to intubation was 4.9 and 3.5 days respectively. And mean and median time from intubation to cannulation was 4.5 and 4.0 days respectively. No difference in these time intervals were present in survivors versus non-survivors. Mean and median time on ECMO was 16.9 and 12 days respectively. Again, no difference in this time interval was present in survivors versus non-survivors. This figure depicts the distribution of hours on ECMO, comparing the survivors with the non-survivors. Again, no statistical difference was seen between survivors and non-survivors. Adjunctive therapies received while on ECMO were remdesivir in 34 patients, convalescent plasma in 44 patients, hydroxychloroquine in 37 patients, interleukin blockers in 45 patients, prostaglandin in 33 patients, and steroids in 54 patients. No statistical difference 
was seen in the use of these adjunctive medications and therapies between survivors and non-survivors. This fascinating figure depicts monthly trends over time in the utilization of these six adjunctive therapies in patients with COVID-19 while on ECMO during the five months of this analysis. The use of remdesivir, interleukin-6 blockers, and steroids increased notably, while the use of hydroxychloroquine and prostaglandin plummeted. Veno arterial ECMO was used in only four patients with only one survivor. Meanwhile, venovenous ECMO was used in the remaining 96 patients with 49 survivors. In conclusion, our analysis of 100 consecutive patients at 20 hospitals reveals that ECMO facilitates salvage and survival of select critically ill patients with COVID-19. Survivors tend to be younger. Survival of patients supported with only venovenous ECMO is 51% in our cohort. Substantial variation exists in drug treatment of COVID-19, but ECMO offers a reasonable rescue strategy. Additional gathering and analysis of data will inform appropriate selection of patients and provide guidance as to the best use of ECMO in terms of timing, implementation, duration of support, and best criteria for discontinuation. Expansion of studies such as the current analysis presented here will provide a means to further define the role of ECMO in the management of severely compromised patients with COVID-19 and will serve to refine the optimal use of ECMO in these patients with the goal of continuing to enhance survival. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, um, Jeff. Kevin, our, um... Uh, the discussants for this um, uh, will be Rania uh, uh, Provenza from uh, Houston, uh, Kevin Akala from Orlando, and myself from Atlanta. Um, Kevin, are you on? I think he was on, but he um, had some connection issues. All right, so maybe I'll go ahead and, uh, Jeff, thank you so much. That was a great, um, a great presentation. I remember seeing this abstract early on. It was just very compelling, and you've built on that from the original abstract that, that you guys submitted. Um, and this is one of the, the early papers presented in cardiac surgery um, uh, from ECMO. So uh, congratulations to you and others for putting this together. Uh, quite, um, uh, so, quite honestly, they're sobering results, right, with a 50% mortality in young patients. So a question for you. Uh, maybe I'll start off while, while Kevin's coming on board or, or, or as Ronnie is also uh, looking. Um, please, I just want to give you a reminder. Please use the Q&A to be able to submit um, any questions that you may have. Uh, for the attendees. Um, so what is the role for, for eCPR, you know, in this management of patients with COVID-19? And, and maybe a second kind of question that falls into that is that um, the patients look like they were an eight-day time period. They were intubated about four days and they were on ECMO for about, you know, uh, four, four or five days. One of the things that we learned early on, we've done about 45, 50 ECMOs at Piedmont Heart Institute, by the way, um, just in our one institution uh, since COVID. And we realized that the patients were taking too long to get intubated or they were getting too long to be put on ECMO. And so that kind of rolls into the role of e eCPR. So can you just comment about that? Were, we, were you early on doing it too slow as far as intubating people and, and going from intubation to, into, into um, ECMO? I, I think, you know, these are both very good questions. This is obviously a multi-institutional uh, series and this is the first 100 patients in our series, which now is up to over 200. So these are patients who were placed on ECMO in March, April, and May. And during that time, none of the institutions involved in this study were offering eCPR. And in fact, even now, none of the institutions are offering eCPR to COVID patients. I think there's so much concern about um, the overall dismal outcomes in COVID patients that when they deteriorate to arresting and getting CPR, uh, it's just something that 
the, the institutions involved in, in this analysis have not been offering. I guess if one had a very young patient without serious comorbidities, one could consider offering eCPR and putting a patient on ECMO during CPR. But there's a lot of complicating factors ranging from the risk the healthcare team might be at uh, trying to cannulate a patient during CPR to the overall grim prognosis. So I, I think as far as eCPR goes, I would summarize by saying, I don't know of any centers that are offering that for COVID at this time, certainly none in our series. And, and, and as far as timing of getting patients onto ECMO, I, I think a general consensus is that the sooner the better, especially in a young salvageable patient, uh, although there's uh, no solid data that I know of that shows outcomes are different in those placed on ECMO earlier rather than later. I think the feeling of most of the hospitals that are doing this is that if ECMO is going to be offered, it should be offered sooner. Past President Kevin, Dr. Ackoff. Yeah, <clears throat> Jeff, thank you for a very nice presentation. You know, there's a lot of discussion about whether Vino Vino uh, uh, ECMO or, or Vino Arterial ECMO is necessary and which is more advantageous. Uh, what, what did your data show in regards to uh, making this decision process? Uh, yeah. And to kind of follow up with Vino's question in regards to CPR, did that change any of your, your plans uh, from a resuscitative uh, effort? Yeah, well, again, it, it, first, in, the, in this series, no patients receive CPR before going on, or while going on ECMO or before going on ECMO. Um, the overwhelming majority of patients in this series, 96 out of 100, received only venovenous ECMO, uh, where the survival was uh, 51%, um, 49 out of 96. In the, in the veno arterial group, there's only four patients with one survivor. I think most centers that were involved in this multi-institutional analysis were reluctant to offer veno arterial ECMO for COVID. I, I think the feeling was that it's reasonable to offer veno venous ECMO in the setting of isolated respiratory failure, but when the disease all of a sudden involves hemodynamic instability, multi-system dysfunction, and cardiac dysfunction, most centers were not offering veno arterial ECMO. The place where it may play a role is similar to the potential role for eCPR in, in the setting of a younger patient without severe comorbidities. But really the only difference we found in the survivors versus the non-survivors in this whole analysis was that the survivors were younger. So I, I think maybe if we had a, a younger patient that um, had I, um, not a lot of other comorbidities, veno arterial might be a reasonable modality but Vino Venus really uh, represents the overall ma majority of patients in this series. That's great. Ronnie, I know we're getting some questions. Um, you want to go through some of, as a digital moderator, do you yes. want to go through some questions that we're getting on the chat? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, Jeff, thank you so much for this great manuscript. I mean, we have uh, one of the questions is, uh, what are the winning criteria for, um, you know, for ECMO and what type of ventilation you use uh, for patients with ECMO, and um, if you can comment on the size of the cannulas yeah. uh, that um, you have used for the ECMO. Yeah, so uh, those are very good questions. In this data set, the criteria for going on ECMO and the criteria for coming off ECMO were based on the criteria and goals at any individual institution. So we didn't capture uh, the detailed blood gas parameters associated with going on ECMO. And similarly, we didn't capture uh, the weaning criteria. That was left up to every individual institution. So I can't really comment on that from this particular data set. Uh, I, I see how in the chat room, um, there's a question that relates to utilizing uh, a dual venous drainage cannula, yeah. such as the Protec duo cannulation. And I think that's, that's a really important question. Initially in March and April, the majority of centers utilizing veno venous ECMO were doing this with two separate veno venous cannula. And part of the reason for that was just to simplify the cannulation strategy, avoid the need for echocardiographic guidance or fluoroscopic guidance for placement of a dual venous drainage cannula. I, I think as people have gotten more experience with COVID, more people are now using a single venous drainage cannula, both for drainage and infusion. Uh, great. And then um, a question is that uh, 
a lot of things have been said regarding the safety uh, for the ECMO team in patients um, taking care for the uh, in uh, for the ECMO team in patients taking care for the COVID um, with COVID. And what are the strategies that we have used to um, you know utilize to assure the safety of the ECMO team uh, uh, I, when they take care of the uh, COVID patients? Yeah, I, I think this is a very important question. And this is a question that uh, I've had the pleasure of discussing with uh, large groups of perfusionists. The, uh, the group that maintains this database uh, specialty care has also um, put on weekly webinars with the perfusionists responsible for patients on ECMO. And we've had multiple discussions with how do we make this safe? And a couple of common themes, one obviously universal precautions, N95 masks, and full protective eyewear. Cannulation takes place in negative pressure rooms. Cannulation uh, for ECMO in this setting is not a teaching case, so the members of the team are minimized where we try to have surgeon, an assistant, a perfusionist in the room, but really nobody else. Very different from uh, some ECMO cannulations where there might be 20 people in the room. We really minimize the number of people in the room. And then um, there's some strategies when the patients are on ECMO that have been utilized by different centers, which include positioning monitors and the ECMO console so that they can be viewed from the window outside the room so that the ECMO specialist monitoring the patient doesn't have to be in the room all the time, but can view the monitors, can view the console and do a lot of the ECMO specialist work from outside the room, minimizing uh, direct exposure. And that's some of the lessons that I've learned from talking with perfusionists and ECMO specialists that are involved uh, taking care of these patients. Yeah, Jeff, uh, we, yeah, we have about two minutes left, Jeff, before we get to the next topic. There's some, uh, first of all, thanks to everybody for all the questions there. I wish we we're, we're gonna try to keep track of this and have Jeff try to send you some answering questions to these uh, later. But one of the questions that, that James Nielsen um, asked um, was the thrombotic issues. I wanna bring that up, especially as a cardiac surgical field, that's important. What, what were there thrombotic issues at, and uh, during this and did you change your anticoagulation protocols during uh, ECMO? I think that's a really important question, James. Uh, that, that's a huge question. And although I didn't present data related to this topic, I can tell you that during these phone conferences and Zoom conferences we had with perfusionists from all over the world, this was a very commonly raised issue. And the general feeling amongst the perfusionists and ECMO specialists is that thrombotic issues are more common in ECMO patients with COVID than other types of ECMO patients. It was a theme that was discussed on multiple Zoom conferences and our team received many phone calls about what's the optimal anticoagulation strategy for COVID patients. Why do we think that they have an increased incidence of thrombotic complications and what can we do about that problem? And I don't think I have any good answers to all of this. Uh, both heparin and bivalrudin have been used for anticoagulation uh, for patients with COVID on ECMO. I think there's a trend over time to use more bival and less heparin, but I really don't have a good answer on how to prevent these dreaded thrombotic complications. But you didn't change the ACT uh, if you're using heparin. You didn't change that as a parameter. You just use regular ECMO parameters for that then, Jeff? Yeah, that, that was the strategy that was used at most of the centers in this study. Yeah. And then I think the ACT parameters and the PTPTT parameters were uh, modified over the course of the study in no controlled fashion, just like these medicines were changed in no controlled fashion. All right, perfect. Uh, and I, I think it's really a concern because thrombotic complications occur more frequently in these patients, but I don't have a good data-driven answer as to how to solve that problem yet. It's certainly an area that needs to be studied. Right, congratulations, Jeff. We're gonna, uh, it was a great study, uh, unbelievably well presented. Um, and um, we're gonna go ahead to the next topics. Harold, you wanna take over? Thank you, Vino. Great. Great job. Our next presentation is going to be a congenital paper, a sequential staging of univentricular palliation within a single hospitalization. It is going to be presented by Dr. Ram Subramanian from the University of Southern California. Ram? The president, moderators, ladies and gentlemen. We now present our results studying sequential staging of univentricular palliation within a single hospitalization. We have no relevant financial disclosures with respect to this presentation. As is well known to this audience, surgical palliation of univentricular physiology entails 
staged surgical procedures that eventually establish a fontan circulation characterized by passive venous return of blood to the pulmonary circuit. Anecdotally, it appears that there is increasing prevalence of keeping infants hospitalized between the first and second stages of surgical palliation for single ventricle physiology. Such an approach may be driven by medical necessity when complex medical care may not be feasible to be delivered in a domestic situation or a social necessity when the family situation may preclude safe discharge. In rare instances, such a practice may be driven by a specific programmatic preference. It is currently unclear if such an approach of keeping infants hospitalized is driven by a perceived increased complexity or preoperative risk prior to stage one palliation and whether such an approach is necessarily associated with worse outcomes. We sought to evaluate the practice of sequential staged univentricle palliation within a single hospitalization with an aim to describe the frequency with which this practice happens, the variability of this practice over time and across centers, and outcomes of patients that are managed by such a strategy. To that end, we queried the STS congenital heart surgery database for the time period January 2010 to June 2018, and specifically collected information on patients who fell into one of two scenarios. Scenario one included all patients whose primary operation was a Norwood procedure, followed during the same hospitalization by any one of the codes for superior cavopulmonary anastomosis, including, say, Henry Fontan or cavopulmonary anastomosis with atrioventricular valvuloplasty or pulmonary arterioplasty, etc. Scenario two included all patients whose primary operation was the hybrid stage one palliation code, such as branch PA bands, ductal stent, or a combination of both, followed again during the same hospitalization by a Norwood procedure. Preoperative characteristics and outcome data were collected and evaluated. We also calculated the proportion of patients who were managed by these kept hospitalized practice over a denominator of all patients who underwent initial Norwood or hybrid stage one operation within each center to assess the variability of practice across centers. The primary endpoints of the study are shown here. We studied outcomes, which included database mortality and post-operative length of stay, defined as days from index operation to database discharge. We studied the time interval between the first eligible cardiovascular operation to the second. And we also lastly studied the prevalence of preoperative risk factors as defined for the primary index operation. Standard statistical methodology was used and here are our results. For scenario one, 5,880 patients underwent an index Norwood operation during this time period of whom 417 or 7.1% patients were kept in the hospital until stage two palliation. In scenario two, following hybrid stage one in 1,132 patients, 204 or 18% patients were kept in the hospital until subsequent Norwood procedure. In both the scenarios, the numbers of patients who were kept hospitalized through to the second stage increased over the duration of the study. Roughly two-fold more patients at 12.3% were kept hospitalized during the 2014 to 18 time period compared to 6.3% patients between the 2010 and 2013 time period. Despite this change, the proportion of patients managed by these staged and kept hospitalized scenarios varies widely across centers as shown in these histograms. The histogram on the left depicts the range of patients who were kept hospitalized through stage two in scenario one. As can be seen, 
this percentage varies from zero to 100% with a median of about 4.1%. To the right of the screen is a histogram for scenario two, again, showing a range that goes from zero to 100%, but this time the median is roughly around 7.1%, a slight move towards the right. This stacked bar graph shows the same data in a different fashion where each bar represents an individual center and the stacked columns in different colors shows the proportion of patients that fall into the various cohorts of management, such as diseased after stage one, discharged alive after stage one, and kept hospitalized through to stage two. Again, this clearly demonstrates that in scenario one, there is wide variability of patients who are kept hospitalized through stage two palliation. A similar stacked bar graph for hybrid shows the same finding of significant inter-institution variability with this practice. For both the scenarios, patients that were kept in the hospital through to the next stage of palliation had significantly higher risk factors pre-stage one intervention. For example, the need for preoperative mechanical circulatory support was 3.7 fold higher in patients who were kept hospitalized compared to those that were not in scenario one and 1.2 fold higher in patients who were kept hospitalized versus those who were not in scenario two. Similarly, mechanical ventilation renal dysfunction and shock present at surgery were all more frequently seen in patients who were kept hospitalized through the subsequent stages of palliation. As would be expected, the postoperative length of stay was significantly prolonged in both scenarios in patients who were kept hospitalized through subsequent stage of palliation. Despite this, survival to hospital discharge was not lower in patients who were kept hospitalized compared to the traditional discharge strategies for either scenario. This is particularly relevant considering that these patients who were kept hospitalized had a longer at-risk time period in the hospital and underwent another subsequent surgery as well. This table shows the numerical values for the results I just presented. Again, postoperative length of stay is statistically significantly higher in both scenario one and scenario two, whereas mortality is not comparably different in either scenarios. In conclusion, sequential staging of univentricular physiology during single hospitalization appears to be increasing in prevalence based on our results, although there is wide variability across centers with the utilization of such a practice. Stage one patients who are kept in the hospital through to the second stage palliation have a higher pre-stage one risk factors and therefore represent a high risk group of patients. Despite belonging to the high risk group, survival to hospital discharge is not lower in the patients who are kept hospitalized through second stage palliation, despite having a longer at risk time frame and having a second stage surgery during the same hospitalization. Based on our results, future studies are required to identify what specific subset cohort of patients are likely to benefit from this strategy of sequential staging of univentricular palliation during the same hospitalization. We thank the society and the organizers for the privilege of this floor, and we'll take any questions at this time point. Thank you. Ram, uh, excellent, excellent presentation. Very interesting. Um, can you maybe uh, tell us why you think this, this is becoming more prevalent over the past, I think you had over eight year period, it seems to have more than doubled the amount of patients doing this. Do you have any thoughts? Are they more complicated patients? Is it as easy as that? Or what are your thoughts? 
Um, thanks, Dr. Burkhardt. That's a great question. Um, with a database study like this, we're purely descriptive. So it's difficult to understand the intent for why these um, types of palliation was chosen. But if we were to speculate, it is possible that more and more patients are now surviving Norwood despite additional risk factors or comorbidities. And therefore, there's a, a greater need to keep them in the hospital between uh, stages. The second may be because we as centers are becoming better at understanding what kind of interstage care is required and what may or may not be provided in an out of hospital setting. So I believe that this change in how we approach the patients may at least in part contribute to the increase in keeping patients in house between two stages. Thank you very much, Ram. Um, before I go on, since I'm sharing the um, podium with Harold, I'd like to thank and acknowledge both Harold and Rainia for chairing the program committee and uh, first planning a face-to-face -face meeting and then planning a virtual meeting, so doing double duty in running the program committee. Thank you both very much. And, and Ram, I'd like to congratulate you for an excellent presentation, and also I'd like to thank you for all of your tremendous leadership with the STS Congenital Heart Surgery Database in general. Uh, I thought that was a very thoughtful presentation that uh, expanded on both the strengths and the weaknesses of STS data, some, a topic that you know about really better than almost anybody at this point. There's a, a question that we have uh, from the discussion panel from uh, Carl Backer. Uh, and uh, we would uh, note, first of all, that Carl Backer is a past Osler Abbott Award winner from 2019, quite recently, also a past CHSS president. And Carl uh, um, has asked um, two questions that relate not only to the study, but to the STS database in general. Uh, I'll ask them both. First, he says, is there any data comparing one year survival between these two groups? And second, he asks, is there any estimate of cost of keeping these patients in the hospital through stage two? Carl, these are both obviously excellent questions, but as you well know, the current STS congenital heart surgery database only collects data until database discharge. It does not um, have reliable data for one year survival or anything other than one year survival outcomes. We've started collecting one-year outcomes in the STS database as part of the last data upgrade. But as for this study, we do not have any information on what the one-year outcomes are, or what the costs are. That doesn't mean the question is not relevant. It's extremely important. We simply don't have the data in the database to answer it. Rob, do you have any idea on, sometimes that scenario too is used because the patients felt too sick to undergo a Norwood, so they may just get bands. Do you have any idea about the number of patients that just got bands with maybe they were gonna get the Norwood but didn't get the Norwood? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, we don't have direct numbers on who had so-called just a band and didn't go through to Norwood. What we do know is in our scenario too, the patients that had hybrid palliation but weren't discharged to the hospital alive from the hospital alive after that stage. We only have that information, but we can certainly collect data on who were banded but did not ever undergo a Norway. Um, thanks, Ram. Um, we've got four more minutes here, so there's a couple of quick questions I can ask from the chat room. Uh, first of all, Andy Lodge, who's another um, active leader in the Southern Thoracic, he asks, do you think your data suggests an advantage to the strategy that you describe, or should a direct comparative study be done? Ideally, a direct competitive study should be done because a lot of these decisions to keep the patient in-house, as we saw, vary between centers, which can only imply that they are heavily influenced by local factors such as case mix and the social situation of the patients uh, and how they're being discharged. So the ideal way to answer this would be a center-specific competitive study to see which methodology results in better outcomes. And thanks, Ram. We'll ask one more final question uh, before we um, move on to the next paper. Uh, Dr. Uh, Palemonikos says, were the groups studied preemptively determined to undergo sequential strategy or was this determined uh, post-op after the first operation? Great question, Tassos. Again, the database doesn't allow us to answer questions of intent like you're asking. That is, did we know upfront that we were gonna keep this patient in-house between the two stages cannot be answered by a database study like ours. All we can say is this subset of patients was kept in-house and this subset was not. So good question, but I don't have an answer from our study. Uh, 
Thank you, Ram, for a tremendous presentation. And thank you to our questioners, Tassos and uh, Andy Lodge and Carl Backer. It's nice to see a strong congenital presentation and presence on this webinar. And with that, we'll turn it over to our uh, third presentation. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, to continue the program, uh, the next presentation will be by Aaron Williams, who's representing the University of Michigan, and they will be he will be presenting similar long-term quality of life outcomes following robotic versus open transhiatal esophagectomy. Dr. Williams. Hello and good afternoon. My name is Aaron Williams, and I'm a fifth-year general surgery resident at the University of Michigan. I'd like to thank the STSA for the opportunity to present here today. Our work highlights comparing long-term patient-reported outcomes between open and robotic transhiatal esophagectomy for esophageal cancer. We do have several disclosures, as you can see here. Esophagectomy continues to be the primary treatment modality for patients with local regional esophageal cancer. Within the last decade, minimally invasive esophagectomy, or MIE, has grown and conferred many benefits over open esophagectomy. These include decreased hospital stay, morbidity, and mortality. These benefits, however, have largely been shown for Ivor Lewis and three hole approaches. Now, patient reported outcomes and quality of life have also become important metrics. MIE has been shown to provide multiple benefits compared to open esophagectomy, including decreased pain and overall better functional status. Again, these benefits have largely been observed comparing open and MIE, IVR, and three-hole approaches. Now, although comparing patient-reported outcomes has become popular, little is known regarding comparing open and MIE THE approaches. Therefore, the aim of this study was to compare long-term patient-reported outcomes involving quality of life and fee of recurrence for patients undergoing open and robotic THE for esophageal cancer. Now to answer this question, we included patients with pathologically or clinically confirmed stage one, two, and three esophageal cancer undergoing open or robotic THE from 2014 to 2018 at a single high volume center. Open or robotic THE approach was based on surgeon preference and all surgeons included had greater than 50 esophagectomies. Regardless of approach, all patients underwent esophagectomy with a CEG anastomosis, pyloromyotomy, and J2 placement. All patients then underwent a standard postoperative pathway. Patients were then assessed prospectively using both quality of life and fear of recurrence questionnaires. The QLQC30 is a 30-item questionnaire evaluating five functional domains of quality of life, function scales, and symptoms, while the OES18 is an 18-item questionnaire that evaluates esophageal cancer-associated symptoms and treatment-related side effects. The fear of recurrence survey measures a patient's anxiety and depression. Questionnaires were administered at baseline as well as one, six, and 12 months post-operation. Scores then underwent linear transformation with higher function scores being better and lower symptom scores being better. Summary scores were also performed. A linear effects model was then used with patients with at least one baseline and one post-operative survey. Time, baseline, demographics, characteristics, and complications were adjusted for. We also looked at secondary outcomes, including patient demographics and perioperative outcomes. In terms of results, there were 212 patients in the open THE group compared to 97 in the robotic THE group. There was a steady decline in survey participation at each time point after surgery to about 40 to 45% up to 12 months. However, these were not significantly different between groups. Patient demographics and characteristics were also compared. There were no significant differences in age, sex, BMI, race, ASA class, preoperative comorbidities, and prior cardiothoracic surgery between groups. There were no significant differences in tumor location, pathologic staging, types of esophageal cancer, and new adjuvant therapy between groups. As I mentioned before, the QLQC30 is a 30-item questionnaire evaluating five functional domains of quality of life, function scales, and symptoms. Similar to other studies, we sought to evaluate global health, physical and role functioning, and pain. We found that there were no significant differences in these metrics between groups at any time points. The remaining metrics on the QLQC30 had similar findings. 
There were also no significant differences in additional function scores and symptom subscores or summary scores between groups at any time point. Again, the OES-18 is an 18-item questionnaire that evaluates a patient's esophageal cancer-associated symptoms and treatment-related side effects. We found that there were no significant differences in symptom subscores, including things such as dysphagia, pain, eating, choking, and trouble with saliva or cough, or summary scores between groups at any time point. The fear of recurrence survey measures a patient's anxiety and depression. We found that there were also no significant differences in these subscores and summary scores between groups at any time point. In terms of perioperative outcomes, the robotic THE patients had significantly decreased length of stay and a higher number of lymph nodes harvested during surgery compared to the open THE group. There were no significant differences, however, in the incidence of any postoperative event, patient disposition, 30-day readmission, reoperation, mortality, discharge status, and need for adjuvant therapy. There was a trend towards lower rates of reoperation with the robotic THE group. At the time of discharge, however, the robotic THE group had a significantly lower number of patients prescribed opiates for pain control. In terms of specific complications, the robotic THE group had lower rates of ileus compared to the open THE group. However, there were no significant differences in cardiac or pulmonary complications, DVT, anastomotic leak, outlet obstruction, or chyle leak between groups. Although this study shows no difference in long-term patient reported outcomes for patients undergoing robotic and open THE, it does have several limitations. The first being, this is a single center study. We also recognize that there has been a change in minimizing opiate prescriptions and promotion of enhanced recovery protocols in recent years. We were also unable to account for surgeon-specific factors, techniques, and patient perception. Now, despite these limitations, this is the largest comparison of robotic versus open THEs comparing clinical outcomes and the only study comparing patient-reported outcomes between these two approaches. In conclusion, this study highlights that there were no clear patient-reported benefits with robotic versus open THE, which is in contrast to other types of MIE studies. However, we did observe that the robotic THE conferred many benefits in perioperative outcomes. As such, other factors such as these outcomes and surgeon experience and comfort may be more important determinants for selecting open versus robotic approaches for THE compared to patient-reported outcomes. We also recognize that a broader evaluation of patient-reported outcomes is also needed to further determine the utility of these metrics. Thank you, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Dr. Williams, that was an outstanding um, uh, presentation. And to start off the discussion will be Dr. Shanda Blackman. I'd like to congratulate Dr. Aaron Williams and his colleagues led by Rishi Reddy at Michigan for an excellent analysis of PRO data among two esophagectomy techniques applied in patients who suffer from esophageal cancer. Esophagectomy patients have one of the highest morbidities, mortalities, suicide rates, unemployment rates, and impaired quality of life compared to the general population or even compared to other cancer groups. While both the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services and the NQF recommend routinely gathering PRO data to improve outcomes and quality improvement, collection of PRO data amongst post-esophagectomy patients is notably absent. The COVID-19 pandemic has shifted many aspects of healthcare to remote patient care delivery and telemonitoring. No one doubts we will be monitoring and exploring the utilization of PRO data to augment what we know in healthcare. Listening to the patient is one of the best new ways that we can enhance outcomes now through PRO data. Tailoring our surgery to accommodate these symptoms patients care about and improve them is a novel way that we as surgeons can improve our care in meaningful ways. Your group at Michigan has carefully evaluated patients at specific time intervals and collected data to inform comparison amongst these two groups. My first question for you is why do you think you had such a steep drop off of patients over time? The percent response went down by 40% at one year. Do you think this was due to the fact that you were not giving them anything in exchange? You were collecting the data and keeping the responses, but the patients might not have been getting their scores back or might not have been getting any intervention based on their score back. 
Do you think that that might have affected your low, low drop-off rate for PRO data? This seems to be is particularly one of the weak points when it regards to pay, PRO data collection, as a lot of different groups are starting to collect the data, but then are having trouble finding meaningful ways to share the data with the patients and have meaningful, impactful findings to correlate with clinical outcomes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Blackman, for that question. And again, thank you to the seller for the opportunity to present here today. Um, so you're totally right. We did have a drop-off rate that was about to 40 to 45% um, out to 12 months following surgery. And this is clearly a limitation of our study. Uh, we definitely wish this number would have been better. Um, however, there are several PRO papers in the literature that do have similar rates up to one year following the study. Um, I think our drop-off rates are due to a number of factors. Um, these include patient uh, death, obviously, uh, is one factor. And then we have a lot of patients that um, come from out of state and we have a pretty wide catchment area that also affects um, difficulty with completing these surveys. Um, in terms of how we did these surveys, we had our nurse research specialists attempt to complete these surveys at one, six and 12 months post-surgery. And we tended to do this in the office with a paper survey. Uh, if patients did not fill out the, or were not able to come to the uh, appointment, we did have the nurses attempt to, to mail surveys and reach out to patients that way. And so obviously, um, you know, that certainly could have affected uh, these patients. Um, I think moving forward, um, we're definitely planning on uh, using technology to help better improve these survey completion rates, uh, whether this is over the phone or using um, an online survey or using a patient portal. Um, and as you mentioned, even incentivizing um, could be a, a way to uh, improve completion rates, although it obviously has its own limitations and bias. Um, and then I totally agree with you on your, your last comment with regards to how we feed this back to patients. I, I totally think that that um, can play a role in patients not completing surveys. Um, and I think this is great information. This data is great information for us to have as clinicians and surgeons. Uh, but we definitely need to feed this back to the patients to help inform clinical decision-making and surgical collect, um, selection. And I think overall, this is very important data for, for patients to know. My second question is the leak rates were quite discrepant between the two groups, 15% in the transhiatal group and 9% in the robotic group. I'd like to congratulate you for such great outcomes uh, with regards to your robotic uh, dissection and the lower leak rate. So do you think that you are underpowered to show a difference between those two groups and maybe there is some meaningful difference if you had more patients enrolled? What are your thoughts on that and what do your surgeons think about that? Yeah, that's a great question as well, Dr. Blackman. Um, so you're right, the robotic THE group had a lower leak rate at 9% compared to 15% in our open THE uh, group. Um, again, the primary outcome of the survey was looking at patient reported outcomes who uh, for patients who complete at least one baseline survey and at least one post-operative survey. Um, so there were a number of other patients that also went, underwent a THE during this time period that were essentially were not included uh, in this cohort of patients just because they didn't complete the, um, the surveys. Um, I definitely think that uh, there could uh, be an underpowering of the analysis then um, that definitely could have showed this to be significant should we have more patients. Uh, we're trying to look overall at our data um, in the last eight years um, since we've been doing robotic THE and open as well uh, to look at kind of a full analysis of uh, these patient outcomes and, and, and hopefully to uh, want to have that soon for, for uh, everyone to see here in the next year or so. So I knew this was coming. Uh, Dr. Steve Yang, who is a legend within the Southern Thoracic, has, asked, has congratulated you on your study. He thought it was beautifully presented but he wants to know if you predict that open transhiatal esophagectomy will become obsolete. And what would Dr. Oringer say? What are the indications at University of Michigan now for open THE based on these results? Yeah, that's a great question, Dr. Yang. Appreciate that. Um, obviously, we all um, have reverence and honor for uh, Dr. Oringer and his uh, um, open THE approach. And I, I think that uh, he, uh, appreciates the, the evolution of how things are going with surgery. I think the robot only um, complements things. And uh, as we sh showed in our study that uh, patients had decreased length of stay, uh, higher lymph nodes harvested, as well as decreased ileus rates. Um, I think right now um, that the open THE will probably always still have a role for patients that have um, significant abdominal surgeries and histories where dissections may be 
um, difficult and such. Um, but we are starting to look at who um, best would uh, benefit from a robotic approach compared to open. And I think patient selection and studying that a little bit more over the uh, next upcoming years will be really important. Um, I'll, and I'll say hello to Dr. Ringer for you as well. <laughs> How do you manage that in your group? If patients come in to University of Michigan, do they, are they asked if they want a robotic or an open approach? Are they offered that when they come in through the front door and then shuttled accordingly? Or do they get what they get when they get referred to their surgeon of choice? Yeah, so we have in our group right now, we have six that can that perform open THE and two that do um, robotic THE. Um, as far as the way this went in our study, um, the robotic approach was um, based on the patient being open to it and robot uh, console availability. And so I imagine as uh, we get another robot and this, you know, our data shows promising, we'll probably continue to use um, the robotic approach. Um, I think there will, again, there will always be a role for the open approach based off patient selection. And we have, in fact, already started to uh, give this data back to patients showing benefits with the perioperative outcomes with our, you know, early studies and, and can highlighting and conveying these patient reported outcomes as well. So we have definitely more work to do and more things to study. Uh, and we look forward to, to doing that here in the next number of years. Uh, Aaron, that, that was a great job. I just have two quick questions. It was interesting that the reoperation rate was almost twice as much for the open THE. I don't know if you could expand on that. Was that the reason that the hospital stay was longer? I think I, I certainly think so. Um, I think you know the robotic approach. I think is uh, there's been increasing adoption of that over the years. Uh, provides awesome visualization for short gastrics up near. Um, you know, the spleen and uh, looking at the stomach a little bit more. And I wonder if we can better preserve um, the uh, blood supply in the area that we're anastomosing, and that certainly can contribute. Um, I do think the robot approach offer also offers um, pretty, pretty amazing visualization for performing the hiatal dissection. And, and actually, we can get pretty high to the level of the carina, if not higher with the lymph node dissection. And I think being able to do that under direct visualization with a robot also, I didn't show this data here, but also um, the robotic group had decreased blood loss compared to the open THE group as well too. And so um, some of the reoperation was due to leak. Some of it was due to uh, bleeding and such. And I think uh, at least our early data here, again, this was, uh, you know, these were the secondary outcomes of our study, but they do appear promising. And I think the robot is uh, being definitely being very, very beneficial in these cases. And I'll so think as with, resident, do you think it's easier to do the open first and then the robotic so you get your bearings? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 love, I love open surgery personally, so it will always have a, uh, um, you know, place in my heart for it. But, uh, but I, I think it is, it's, it's awesome to, to see the anatomy, the lay of the land and how to do this case. And then it definitely sets up things um, nicely for once you get a feel for the operation and doing it robotically. And I think they're both great approaches. And just one other thing about blood loss is you happen to go back and look at surgeon glove size. I think a lot of times on some of these patients, you know, through a transhadal, it can be a little aggressive, you know, uh, manipulation of the esophagus up through there. And the robot may take away that bleeding issue from the, you know, asgus vein branches or, you know, periaortic vessels coming off. Uh, that's just kind of a funny comment. But the last one was that if you looked at, I think robotic is the way to when these patients were discharged from the hospital, almost twice as many were sent to a rehab center or to a nursing home compared to the open technique. And I thought that was very surprising. Yeah, uh, both great comments. Uh, we did not look at the glove size, but obviously that does uh, that does play a role in the approach and getting you know in the mediastinum and uh, and up that way. Um, and then again, that's also a great question as well. We. Um, there is a, you know, a doubling in terms of the uh, discharge, you know, dispo status. Um, again, I think the study was probably truly underpowered to look at full differences. I do think that's an interesting point. I think in the future, we need to obviously um, get a larger cohort and even start performing multi-institutional studies to get a better lay of the land for uh, comparing perioperative outcomes between the approaches. And there was one other question uh, that came across uh, from Dr. Nielsen. I uh, wanted to know about the number of robotic cases uh, that were done by the surgeons. Was there a learning curve that occurred during this time period? 
Yes, that's a great question as well. Um, prior to the start of uh, prospectively enrolling patients in this study, um, all surgeons had completed at least um, 50 esophagectomies, um, including the robotic cohort. So we, we do feel like uh, the staff faculty um, were well beyond their learning curve uh, for this operation for the, for the study. I think we have time for one last question. Mark Block was asking if any of your surgeons do a laparoscopic approach or is it one or the other, either open transhiatal or robotic? Yeah, that's a great question, Dr. Block. Um, we do have a number of surgeons that do a laparoscopic approach um, for the, uh, just making the uh, data homogenous. We chose to just include robotic, um, but we do have a number of uh, staff that do laparoscopic. Um, I do think that the robot has the advantage over laparoscopy in terms of able to get up into the hiatus and the mediastinum. And I think with the robot, you can do uh, a much higher dissection, again, to the level of the uh, carina, if not higher with the robot. And I think that's just something that is a little tougher to pull off laparoscopically. And so I think, uh, you know, that approach, the robotic approach can contribute to decreased blood loss and better lymph node harvesting. Again, I haven't compared the robotic to the laparoscopic data. But I think, you know, if one of the criticisms of THE is the oncologic resection, I think the robot can definitely help um, um, visualize that and get a much better radial margin and even have less blood loss. Congratulations, Aaron. Nice job fielding questions. Excellent job. Let's go on to the next presentation. So we're going to continue the um, webinar with the second adult cardiac surgery paper. And uh, before that, we would like actually to thank all the past presidents of the Southern that, who participating in the dialogue and the chat. So the second adult cardiac surgery paper is from Dr. Uh, Mehafi and colleagues from University of Virginia regarding the um, aortic annular enlargement, short and long-term outcomes in the United States. Dr. Mehafi. Hello, and thank you for the opportunity to present our work entitled Aortic Annual Enlargement, Short and Long-Term Outcomes in the United States, on behalf of myself and my co-authors. Patient prosthesis mismatch is associated with significant long-term morbidity and mortality after aortic valve replacement, and has garnered significant interest with the rise in transcatheter aortic valve replacement and valve and valve tapping. However, indications and outcomes of annual enlargement in order to allow for a larger prosthesis, remain poorly defined. The purpose of this study was to describe the safety and current practice patterns around the use of annular enlargement across the National SDS database. We hypothesized that increasing rates of annular enlargement may lead to improved outcomes for patients at risk for severe patient prosthesis mismatch. We began by querying the STS National Adult Cardiac Surgery Database and identified over 600,000 patients undergoing aortic valve replacement with or without concomitant coronary artery bypass grafting between 2008 and 2016. After excluding patients who underwent emergent operations, operations for endocarditis, patients on mechanical support, or those undergoing other concomitant procedures, we had just under 400,000 patients undergoing aortic valve replacement. These patients were then matched with Medicare-linked data to obtain long-term follow-up and survival data. Our final population was 189,268 Medicare-linked aortic valve replacement patients with or without concomitant cabbage. Patient prosthesis mismatch was defined by calculated effective orifice area index based on patient body surface area and manufacturer effective orifice area with an EOAI of less than 0.65 defining severe patient prosthesis mismatch. Patients were stratified by annular enlargement for univariate, multivariate, and time to event analysis to evaluate early and late outcomes. We looked at the yearly trend in use of annular enlargement over the study period and see here that there's no significant change between 2008 and 2016. When we assess baseline characteristics and operative risks, we see patients undergoing annular enlargement were significantly younger and had lower rates of preoperative comorbidities. However, there was no significant difference in the predicted risk of mortality based on STS risk scores. 
However, when we compare patients undergoing annular enlargement to those who did not undergo annular enlargement, but were at risk for moderate or severe patient prosthesis mismatch, we again see the patients were younger. However, the preoperative comorbidities were significantly uh, worse in the patients with moderate and severe patient prosthesis mismatch, and the STS predicted risk of mortality was significantly higher. When we assess short-term outcomes, we see that operative mortality, major morbidity, and the composite major morbidity or mortality were significantly associated with annual enlargement in unadjusted models. This was again true after STS risk adjustment with an odds ratio of 1.55 for operative mortality. However, there was no statistical association between annual enlargement and postoperative pacemaker placement in this cohort. Next, we assess non-fatal long-term outcomes, and we see here that hospitalization for stroke, hospitalization for heart failure, and aortic valve reoperation were not significantly associated with annular enlargement in unadjusted or risk-adjusted models. When we assess long-term survival using landmark analysis, we see over the first three years, annular enlargement was associated with significantly higher risk of mortality. However, after the first three years, this was associated with a significantly lower risk of mortality in unadjusted models. After risk adjustment with the STS risk score, we see again higher risk over the first three years with no association uh, between annual enlargement and survival after three years. This figure demonstrates the survival curves and how they cross at approximately three years with annual enlargement group illustrated in blue. There are important limitations to this study, including the STS database does not capture the specific annual enlargement technique performed. The study was limited to patients over the age of 65 on Medicare in order to obtain long-term data on readmissions and survival. However, this may not be representative of outcomes in all patients undergoing annual enlargement. Finally, patient prosthesis mismatch calculations were based on valve size uh, used and patient body surface area, which does not readily identify patients who were spared from moderate or severe patient prosthesis mismatch with an annual enlargement. In conclusion, we illustrate no change in national trends of annual enlargement through the rise of TAVR and valve and valve TAVR. We demonstrate an increased short-term morbidity and mortality in the Medicare population undergoing annual enlargement. And we establish no association between annual enlargement and long-term reoperation, readmission for heart failure or stroke, regardless of projected patient prosthesis mismatch. Finally, we highlight that survival curves cross after three years suggesting a potential long-term benefit with annual enlargement in selected patients. So in closing, annual enlargement is still only done in the minority of patients over the age of 65 who are, who are at risk for patient prosthesis mismatch. Increased early risk with no clear long-term benefit was seen in this Medicare population. However, Patient, uh, annual enlargement may be considered in patients with predicted moderate to severe patient prosthesis mismatch in whom a long-term survival benefit may outweigh the early risk. Thank you, and I'd be happy to take any questions at this time. Uh, Dr. Mahaffey, thank you so much uh, for this important uh, paper. And we're going to start our discussion with the past president of the Southern uh, Thoracic Association, Dr. Kevin Akola. Kevin. Yes, thank you. Uh, Arania, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Yes, yeah, sorry. I don't think the video is, is uh, working. Uh, the, um, you know, this is an important study because as we're entering this era of uh, valve and valve surgery as a, as, a, as a secondary strategy, as these patients age, I think it's important uh, to have this um, 
in our strategy in patients where we're placing smaller valves. Uh, I guess the question I have is, is one hunter, and that was an excellent presentation, is uh, are, what are your certainties uh, that these were true annular enlargements uh, versus uh, uh, root augmentations? Um, if you could answer that, and then I have a follow-up question. Yeah, certainly. Thank you for the question. Um, you know, obviously we're limited by uh, the STS database and, and how, um, how these are coded. Um, we, we actually um, recently looked at this within our own institution and within um, the Virginia Collaborative, and we're able to do some chart review and found that at least in our institution, um, the, the patients who were, um, who were documented and recorded as having annual enlargement, um, the accuracy was greater than 99% um, over the, the 20 years at, uh, at our institution. So um, obviously I can't speak to that for the, for the national data. Um, but, but that is certainly a limitation. You know, we don't have uh, the specifics of what type of annual enlargement um, was performed. Um, so that is, that, that's the limitation of the study. Okay, that's, that's often difficult because of a lack of good documentation. I appreciate that. And the purpose of annular enlargement, as you stated uh, during AVR, is to allow a larger prosthesis uh, to, present, to, to uh, prevent patient prosthetic mismatch, which obviously, as we all know, has been detrimental to long-term effects uh, in regards to heart failure, reduced survival, need for reoperation, et cetera. But why does uh, the present data not demonstrate uh, some of these long-term uh, benefits for patients undergoing annular enlargement with the curves uh, crossing uh, after three years. Uh, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I think that's a really important question. And, and this, uh, this study, I have to um, also thank my co-authors, a uh, sort of multi-institutional collaborative here that, uh, that participated in the design of this study, because um, it's really a, a very difficult question to answer. We felt like the the long-term outcomes, um, the readmission, uh, the reoperation were going to be very important outcomes to to have for this population. So we elected to use the um, the combined uh, or the merged STS Medicare data, uh, which limited us to a population over the age of 65. Um, 65 doesn't sound that old um, when you're when you're thinking about it, but the actual uh, me, uh, median population or median age of our population was 75. So. Um, you know, the, the, the patients that we were looking at were, were certainly much more advanced in age, and um, perhaps the early risk associated with the, with the annual enlargement, um, you know, so the, the juice wasn't worth the squeeze, if, um, if, if that makes sense, but they didn't uh, live long enough to see the, uh, the long-term benefits of, uh, of the annual enlargement. Um, I think the other important uh, consideration here um, is the... Uh, patient prosthesis mismatch was based on, you know, our categorization of that was based on projected um, uh, numbers uh, based on the body surface area and what valve was used. So there's, there's clearly limitations of the valve charts um, and the cutoffs for these uh, indexed effective orifice areas. So um, perhaps we weren't um, accurately portraying what the, what the patient's true annular size was. Okay. Well, thank and, you. Hunter. And yeah, thank you very much. And I think there's a lot of uh, members on this call that probably also do not think 65 years of age is that uh, old. But thank you. Excellent presentation. And thanks for contributing to uh, the STSA webinar. Thank you. Uh, James, thank, uh, thank you. That was an um, excellent presentation. Uh, as Kevin mentioned before, I mean, uh, these surgical techniques really uh, for annular enlargement have been around for a long time. I mean, since maybe uh, 1970s. Uh, but uh, definitely the last decade, there is um, a renewed interest in these uh, procedures. So I noticed as, um, in your presentation that uh, the rate of the annular um, enlargement uh, was uh, 2 to 3% uh, during your study period. So my question is, uh, were the authors surprised by um, this finding? And then uh, why do you think the rate was so low if uh, two thirds of the population had moderate to severe um, patient prosthesis mismatch? Certainly, that is, uh, that's an important question. And, and we were surprised, you know, especially, we, we really expected, you know, even with a, even if it was a lower rate um, nationally, we would have, ex or we did expect to see a, a growth in the use of annual enlargement over the rise of valve and valve taver as people were thinking about 
okay, um, you know, going to put a, a bioprosthetic valve in, in a younger patient, try to set them up for a future valve and valve, uh, make sure that's going to be large enough. Uh, but that really was not borne out in the data, um, you know, up through 2017. Um, and, uh, and that was very surprising. Um, it's kind of one of our, our primary take home messages, I think. Um, and then the other, the other side of that is it, it certainly adds complexity to the operation. Um, there's no doubt it adds bypass time. Uh, there's an increase in blood transfusion. Um, and the, the risk of uh, increased STS major morbidities is, is real. Um, the increased renal failure, prolonged ventilation. Um, so I think all of this is it's a balancing act. Um, so, I, I, you know, I, I, it is surprising, but, um, but it's important to know what the, the national practice patterns are. Yeah, great. And um, I would like to ask you um, also, but as well as, um, uh, you know, our current president, Dr. Thurani, uh, do you think like a better study that can be performed? Yeah, I mean, I'm a co-author for this. Uh, I'll pull a Dan Miller and make a comment on, on, um, on a paper that's already mine. Yeah, Dan, I, I hope you're still listening. So, um, no, I think that there, this is, this is, this troubles me in some ways um, a little bit because I feel like we're going backwards a little bit in time. You know, as, as here we are, the surgeons struggling with TAVR and surgery, and um, TAVRs have a better EOA than surgery does. And then for the first time in the Partner 3 study, we showed that surgery did a better job than TAVR did for gradients because we did a lot more aggressive root enlargements and things like that. Mike Mack and I've talked a lot about that. So, I, you know, I, I don't know the right answer, Ronnie. That's a good question. But, you know, I'm, I'm a little worried that this, the message shouldn't be stop doing root enlargements in patients. I think that's a, that's a very bad message to send to surgeons. It's not okay to put a 19 valve in somebody that's my size or 100 size. Don't do that. I mean, I, I think we have to be careful in how we do it. I mean, uh, clearly we have to think about other other roles, I was going to kind of throw it back to Hunter. One of the questions for you is, <laughs> surgicalist prosthetic valves, is that something to, to prevent having PPM? <clears throat> uh, certainly. Yeah. You know, I think some of this comes back to the validity of the uh, valve charts um, and, you know, how, how well we believe the cutoff for, for indexed uh, effective orifice area. Um, there's no doubt those, those valves do, do have better, uh, better performance numbers. Um, but, you know, I, I think ultimately the the question uh, would be best answered by um, doing a study where we can match patients uh, based on their actual annular size um, preoperatively, and then follow them out over a longer period of time. And again, it would need to be an uh, an all claims database or something that would include um, younger patients who who, in I think most people's opinion, uh, stand to have the most benefit of a of an annual enlargement um, to set them up for the future. Yeah, the last thing, I think we have maybe about 20 seconds left, uh, just to ask you a question, and I, I really agree with this from Andy Lodge, who says, you know, this is an older patient, could the study be done in younger patients? And that's the one thing I would look at with the National Death Index, we could do that potentially. What are your thoughts about that, Hunter, real quick? Yeah, absolutely. I think that would be, uh, that'd be fantastic, you know, as that new data um, is available within STS. Certainly look at the, um, the mortality. That obviously doesn't tell the whole story. That's the thing I loved about the, the Medicare data is that we yep. got the readmissions, we got the, um, the reoperation. Uh, that's perfect. Well, uh, I think, uh, Hunter, that was absolutely great um, uh, presenting and, and uh, the questions afterwards. So I think and now we're going to go to Jeff. Well, thank you, Vino and Hunter. Again, congratulations for a fantastic presentation using STS data linked to Medicare data very well presented and a very thoughtful analysis. Uh, the fifth of the six presentations uh, today is going to be given uh, by Dr. Bill Novick. And um, it, it really gives me a great honor to introduce Dr. Novick. He's really one of the heroes of the Southern Thoracic. This guy travels all around the world um, operating um, in remote destinations and saving the lives of children. And uh, he recently just got back uh, from a trip uh, last month where, he, where Dr. Novick and his team operated on 40 children in Iraq. He's back in town to make this presentation and another presentation at the ACC. And then uh, after that, he's uh, off to Libya to operate on more children there. 
So he's a, a real hero, done wonderful work, and uh, we're very proud to have him as a member of the Southern. He's going to give a talk now that's uh, entitled Late Results Following Closure of Ventricular Septal Defects with Elevated Pulmonary Vascular Resistance and Pulmonary Hypertension <coughs> using the uh, flap double, <coughs> double valve technique. Uh, Dr. Novick. <coughs> I'd like to thank the program committee of the association for providing us with the opportunity to prevent our study of the early and late results following closure of ventricular septal defects in patients with elevated pulmonary vascular resistance and pulmonary hypertension utilizing the flap valve double patch technique. We have no disclosures to make. In upper income countries, large VSDs are closed in infancy before the development of pulmonary hypertension and elevated pulmonary vascular resistance. In low and middle income countries, the delay in diagnosis and treatment results in children presenting at an older age for VSD closure, having already established pulmonary hypertension and elevated resistance. Mortality risk in low and middle income countries is high for these patients as these countries are without expensive medications for pulmonary hypertension treatment or ECMO rescue. We developed a unidirectional flow VSD closure patch to decrease the mortality risk. This is a single institutional retrospective study between May of 1996 and April of 2016. All patients presenting for VSD closure with PAH underwent cardiac catheterization with 100% oxygen provocation following baseline studies. Beginning in April of 2005, all patients presenting with VSD and PAH were started on sildenafil at three milligrams per kilogram per day for two to three months prior to cardiac catheterization. All patients who did not drop their PVR to normal with provocation received the unidirectional VSD closure patch. All patients received the pulmonary artery pressure line before leaving the operating room. An echocardiographic assessment of systolic PA pressure was obtained daily on discharge and at all follow-up visits. Analysis of the early and long-term results compared the sildenafil to the non-sildenafil groups. A total of 40 patients underwent double patch closure and are the subject of this study. Now here you can see the patient demographics and baseline hemodynamics. And as you can see, there's basically no difference between the demographics of the patients. Baseline hemodynamics, so you do see differences in the systolic pulmonary artery pressure, the PA to systemic pressure ratio, the QPQS, the percentage of patients with a QPQS of less than 1.5, the absolute oxygen saturation, and the percentage of patients with oxygen saturation of less than 90%. All of these were much higher in the non-sildenafil group. Now, with oxygen provocation, only one thing changed between the two groups, and that was the QPQS. It rose to 3.16 in the sildenafil group and 1.70 in the non-sildenafil group. ICU and discharge data is seen here. The only thing that was really significantly different was mechanical ventilation time, which was significantly less in the sildenafil group. Inotropic score approached significance lower in the sildenafil group, but did not achieve significance. Hospital discharge mortality was 2.5%. Now, we looked at the pulmonary to systemic pressure ratios over time uh, as a function of the median. And here you can see that there was a decrease, as you would expect, in pressure as the patients went through the system and had their VSD closed. Upon discharge, the mean pulmonary to systemic pressure ratios increased slightly, and there was a slight decrease at final follow-up. There was a significant difference between the lowest value, which was in the ICU, and the follow-up and discharge PA pressures. The degree of pulmonary hypertension at last follow-up, 21% with no, 40% with mild, 21% with moderate, and 18% with severe pulmonary hypertension. And as you can see from the Kaplan-Meier curve here, freedom from severe PAH was over 80% for both groups at 15 years, and was actually 79.5% at 21 years for the non-sildenafil group. Freedom from death after discharge is seen here. And as you can see, there was excellent survival uh, following discharge. Um, as I mentioned, there was only one late death, and so we had a 97.3% overall survival at 15 years. Limitations of the study, it was retrospective, it was a single institution, it was a small sample size, 
and there was less time for follow-up in the sildenafil group. However, we believe the inferences are sildenafil pretreatment improves baseline catheterization hemodynamics and post-provocation QPQS compared to no pretreatment, thereby improving preoperative hemodynamics. Patients with sildenafil are extubated earlier postoperatively, facilitating postoperative management. Long-term survival is excellent in this cohort. Late severe pulmonary hypertension is less than 20%, and double patch operations in patients with severe PAH and elevated pulmonary vascular resistance can be carried out with low early and late mortality. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, uh, thank, you, thank you very much, Dr. Novick, for uh, a thoughtful, provocative presentation and uh, also for all the great work that you do. Uh, I will start the discussion and then uh, after that, my co-moderator Harold will also be able to bring some questions from the chat room. Um, I, I'd like to ask you, uh, wh why not simply create a fenestration within the middle of the VSD patch and then let the cardiologist close it later with a device? Why uh, instead utilize the approach that you've so nicely described? Well, thanks for the question, Jeff. Um, you know, you have to look at the economics in low and middle income countries. And to give you an idea, the cost of a VSD closure device in a low and middle income country frequently exceeds the cost of the entire operation performed primarily. That's number one. Number two, um, if you leave the hole, you're still getting left to right shunning occurring in these patients. And although the pressure difference is significant, you still have an excess flow through the pulmonary bed and are still contributing to damage uh, to the pulmonary vascular bed. So our preference is to put the flap valve in and allow these patients to close it on their own as their LV pressures increase. Is that, is that the same approach you'd use in the United States uh, if there was the resources available for a device? You know, um, the politically correct answer is yes, but the surgeon answer is why subject these kids to having to go back to the cath lab when you can take care of it in the operating room the first time around? So, uh, you know, that's a <clears throat> sort of a double-edged question. Yeah, nice answer too. <laughs> we have a few questions from, uh, from the attendees. I enjoyed it. Uh, very much, Dr. Nozick. I've, I've used this technique based on one of your earlier publications where you had drawings on how to do this patch. Some of the attendees wanted to know if you could describe in a nutshell how you make the patch, and then also, is there anticoagulation involved with this? So let me answer the second question first, because we don't use any anticoagulation on these children. Um, this is a very small part of the total group that we've operated on. We've actually done more than 250 kids around the world and we have yet to use even aspirin on these children. Uh, regarding the patch, what we do is, um, Harold, we, we go ahead and create the VSD patch based upon our analysis of the VSD when we open the right atrium and look across the valve. And then once you get the patch tailored, what we use is a one half of the Z value for the aortic valve for that particular child as the size of the fenestration. Once that's made on the LV side, over approximately 33% of the circumference, you attach the patch so that it can act you know, as a flap valve. And to prevent the valve from flapping all the way over should you get really bad pulmonary hypertension, we put a tethering stitch in at the apex at the bottom, which is equal to the same size as the fenestration. We put a Hagar through, Let's say the fenestration is a six, for example. Put a six Hagar through and tie the tethering stitch over that so that it can only open to that extent. And, and what do you have follow up on what happens to mo most of these? Are most of them closed at follow up? Yes. <clears throat> now, let me say this that in the cold extremes, so the kids that we've operated on in Belarus and in northern Ukraine and in northern Russia. Some of those children have kept their flap valves open um, for as long as four or five years post-operatively. Um, and we have a group of kids that we operated on in Colombia, and those children there, uh, because of the high altitude in Bogota, when they go to visit the beach, they turn pink. When they're in Bogota, they're blue. 
All right. <laughs> so, and then the, I assume that you're going to be treating all these patients if you can now with sildenafil preoperatively. Um, and what, what, when do you stop that? So <clears throat> the criteria that we use postoperatively is this, the systemic, the pulmonary, uh, the pulmonary to systemic pressure ratio is less than 0 0.4. Then we'll actually take the patients off their sildenafil. So um, we look at them in the ICU before the catheter is removed, um, make the decision then, then at the discharge echo, they get a decision made then. And then at every follow-up, um, we're evaluating that for potentially stopping their sildenafil. Well, I, I think, um, thank you for a great presentation and also a very uh, nice discussion. Uh, with uh, where well, we covered a lot of important issues and, and, and thank you again for all the great work that you do and, and safe travels to Libya, uh, which I know is the next trip coming up shortly. It is, it is. Thank and, you very much, Jeff. Very nice introduction. I'm, <clears throat> I'm not sure I was worthy of it, but it was certainly nice. Uh, you are, and, uh, and, and we all know it. Uh, and there was a lot of nice comments about you in the chat box while you were making the presentation as well. You should know that as well. And, and with that, we'll move on to our uh, final presentation of the day, and I'll turn it over to our uh, colleagues from thoracic surgery. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Dr. Sean Whiteman. He is uh, accompanied by his colleagues from, the, from USC, led by Dr. Tony Kim, and he'll be talking about adjuvant chemotherapy for visceral pleural invasion in three to four centimeter non-small cell lung cancer and how it's associated with improved survival. Thank you, Dr. Whiteman and your team. I would like to thank the Southern Thoracic Surgical Association for the opportunity to present our abstract titled Adjuvant Chemotherapy for Visceral Pleural Invasion in Three to Four Centimeter Non-Small Cell Lung Cancer Improved Survival. I have no disclosures. Current American Joint Committee on Cancer guidelines stage tumors three to four centimeters in size to the T stage of T2A. Similarly, smaller tumors with any visceral pleural invasion are also staged T2A. This means that smaller tumors who would by size receive a T1A through T1C classification are upstaged to T2A given the same T2A designation as a larger tumor. Pleural invasion is classified into three groups. The involvement of the visceral pleura in the PL1 and PL2 groups causes the upstaging of tumors less than three centimeters to the T2A designation. Current National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines recommend chemotherapy for tumors with high-risk features in T2A N0 stage 1B patients. These high-risk features include visceral pleural invasion, but current guidelines do not break down these recommendations based on tumor size, simply the presence or absence of visceral pleural invasion. We hypothesized that adjuvant chemotherapy in these stage one patients who would normally not receive it due to the size less than four centimeters and node negative status would significantly improve five-year survival if visceral pleural invasion was noted. The National Cancer Database was queried from 2010 to 2016 for cases of non-small cell lung cancer with clinical stage one disease that were less than four centimeters, node negative, who subsequent, subsequently underwent surgical resection. These stage one non-small cell lung cancers were stratified according to clinical tumor sizes. This cohort was then divided into groups with and without visceral pleural invasion and further divided based upon the administration of adjuvant chemotherapy. This then resulted in 16 separate subgroups based on size. The presence or absence of visceral pleural invasion and presence or absence of adjuvant chemotherapy. Kaplan-Meier analysis was used to calculate five-year overall survival 
for patients categorized by tumor size, visceral pleural invasion status, and receipt of adjuvant chemotherapy. Multivariable Cox regression, adjusting for tumor size and visceral pleural invasion status, was used to determine associations between use of adjuvant chemotherapy and overall survival. A total of approximately 61,000 patients met our inclusion criteria, 51,000 without visceral pleural invasion and 10,000 with visceral pleural invasion. As expected, when all tumors less than four centimeters were grouped together, survival was worse if visceral pleural invasion was present, 66.2% compared to 59.2%. In general, survival was worse when visceral pleural invasion was present. When tumors were grouped by size, as well as visceral pleural invasion involvement, overall survival for each of the separate four staged-based size groups was significantly worse if visceral pleural invasion was discovered, ranging from five to 8% survival difference for each tumor size group. When visceral pleural invasion was selected and all tumor sizes were grouped, the addition of adjuvant chemotherapy improved five-year survival by almost 7%. When looking at tumors with visceral pleural invasion grouped by tumor size, only tumors three to four centimeters had a statistically significant increase in five-year overall survival for patients receiving adjuvant chemotherapy, 68.8% compared to 50%. On multivariable Cox regression, adjuvant chemotherapy for three to four centimeter tumors with visceral pleural invasion was similarly associated with significantly longer five-year overall survival. The limitations to the study are the limitations attributed to the National Cancer Database, including its retrospective nature, as well as lacking cancer-specific mortality. For this project specifically, the database lacks granularity regarding the different degrees of visceral pleural invasion. An additional limitation is the lack of clinical patient-specific knowledge on why adjuvant chemotherapy was selected for some stage one patients and not others. In conclusion, visceral pleural invasion remains a poor prognostic factor in clinically node negative four centimeter or less stage one non-small cell lung cancer patients. Guidelines recommend adjuvant chemotherapy for high risk T2A N0 patients including those patients with visceral pleural invasion. Based on the analysis demonstrated here, our hypothesis is specifically supported for tumors three to four centimeters in size. Adjuvant chemotherapy should indeed be considered for patients with tumors three to four centimeters in size and visceral pleural invasion due to an observed five-year overall survival advantage. I would again like to thank the Southern Thoracic Surgical Association for this opportunity, and I am happy to take any questions. Sean, that was an outstanding presentation, and uh, I'd like to uh, ask you three short questions. The first one is, as you stated in your limitations, that you don't, you don't know why they received chemotherapy, but were you able to look back at the institution that they received uh, their treatment such as an academic institute. Also, was there any relationship in regards uh, to the uh, payer's uh, insurance? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for that question. And uh, thank you also for the opportunity. Um, yeah, we, we can't determine uh, why the patients were given adjuvant chemotherapy from the database. And that, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, was something we identified um, as a limitation. Um, only half of the patients receiving chemotherapy had visceral pleural invasion, so they received it for some other identifying factor. Mm -hmm. But um, 
But this is the exact reason why we wanted to look at this pro project, because tumors less than four centimeters aren't classically given adjuvant chemotherapy. And we wanted to determine if patients with visceral pleural invasion were receiving it and, and was there a benefit. Um, but in terms of whether there's variations in the type of institution and whether there's variation in uh, um, uh, insurance payer, um, th that's an excellent question, and one that, that I'm actually very curious about. Um, institution type and insurance payers, they weren't specifically identified and separated in our analysis down to the level of tumor size, visceral pleural invasion, and adjuvant chemotherapy. But that said, when we did look at our Cox regression for tumors with visceral pleural invasion, the institution type and insurance payer, uh, they were not associated uh, with any increase in uh, or with any survival um, difference. Okay. Uh, second question, was there any difference in regards to the survival in those patients in regards to the type of resection, especially looking at patients who had a formal lobectomy versus a limited resection, such as a wedge resection? Yeah, yeah, there was. Um, wedge resection came, came up as a uh, poor prognostic factor for overall survival. And, and I think what we're seeing there is just the, the findings that support that, are, you know, some of our current data that wedge resections aren't great cancer operations. And, and that was demonstrated through all of our tumor cohorts for these smaller size tumors. Okay. And finally, just looking at more histopathologic characteristics, were y'all able to look at uh, lymph uh, lymphovascular invasion or perineuronal invasion to kind of, you know, put that with the visceral pleural invasion to see if that made a difference. Yeah, we could look at those factors and, and, and maybe we should, but we, we didn't in this study. Uh, we didn't specifically focus it to answer those questions. You know, I think there's something there. Maybe, maybe there's going to be some type of melting pot or a future scoring system that we can use for some of these smaller sized tumors based on multiples of risk factors that you know, can we, we can use to then create an assessment tool on whether patients should receive adjuvant chemotherapy. Yeah. And currently now at USC, uh, what is your protocol for these patients now? Are they receiving adjuvant therapy or is it depending on their biomarkers or immunotherapy or where are you going from here? Yeah, so for our, the smaller tumors in the cohort, you know, those um, with two, three centimeters in size, we're not currently giving or offering adjuvant chemotherapy unless they have other risk factors that are giving them a higher risk profile in our mind. But for some of the larger tumors, we do consider it uh, a little bit more highly, especially considering you know, the study that we've been working through over the past few months. Okay, Shanda? Sean, I congratulate you on an excellent paper and an excellent presentation. Um, I, would, I just have a few comments. Uh, well, I think while the definition of visceral pleural invasion is clear, according to the AJCC, I would say that not everyone is aware of it. And there's a lot of heterogeneity in how it's uh, interpreted amongst pathologists, especially in the NCDB. Um, for instance, even in the introduction of your paper, when I read the manuscript, you state that PL1 is not beyond the elastic layer in the visceral pleura, PL2, is visceral pleural invasion beyond the elastic layer and PL3 is invasion into the parietal pleura. That's really not true. PL1 and any visceral pleural invasion for that matter means the tumor breached the external elastic lamina of the visceral pleura. As the visceral pleura has two elastic laminas, that sometimes leads to confusion and it has to be the outer external layer, not the internal layer. So any study that require like this might require a re-review of that aspect by an expert thoracic pathologist to prevent the pathology interpretation from being confusing, especially when you're drawing such landmark con conclusions like you are in your, in your paper. Although that might not be feasible, we do encourage that you add this to your manuscript. The other issue I see sometimes is that visceral pleural invasion is missed as the elastic layer is pulled down by the tumor. And this, uh, you can only really identify if you do an elastic stain. So if you do toluidine blue on the frozen section, you can sometimes see that. 
So I would recommend that you include this addition to your and this detail into your manuscript as a limitation. Um, so I do have one additional question other than my comment. So why was the visceral pleural invasion assessment limited to tumors less than four centimeters in size? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, and I really do appreciate your comment. Um, I think that those definitions for the, the plural invasion are, are important, especially when we're um, uh, making uh, evaluation and patient decisions based on that. But uh, in terms of the size limitation, we decided to limit the tumors to less than four centimeters to try to eliminate any other confounding factors on why patients would receive adjuvant chemotherapy for other reasons. We really wanted to be able to focus on visceral pleural invasion and its association with adjuvant chemotherapy. Were you able to differentiate the difference between PDL1 and PL as it relates to the pleural invasion? Uh, so we were able to group PL1 and PL2 together, and we were able to uh, use those to determine whether the visceral pleural invasion was there as a definition, but we were not able to separate those two groups because same reason that you identified that we would be bound to the histologic assist assessment of uh, varying pathologists nationwide. Okay, thank you. Dr. Miller? No, I, I agree with that. It, it all goes down to the pathologist and especially when you're, you're looking at people who have limited lung function and so forth, you know, should you, you know, do that lobe or, you know, definitely do a segmentectomy on those smaller ones. But when you get up to those three and four centimeters, you know, usually looking at a, at a lobe on those patients and so forth. But it is, it goes back to the pathologist and also goes back to the techs who are measuring those specimens. You know, if they're 3.8 centimeters, 3.9, you know, it makes a big difference in that patient's survival. So that's very important as, as we look into this in the future, it, it, it is related to size. I'd Thank like you. to take a minute just to congratulate you on an excellent fielding of questions and an excellent presentation. Um, this is just a good example of how we're starting to answer important questions amongst these patients and how the STSA is playing a role in that. So thank you again. Yeah, well, thanks for the opportunity and I appreciate the questions and comments. Okay. All right, great job. <laughs> great. Thanks everybody. Uh, I, there was a lot of people to thank. If I could have uh, the presenters, um, the moderators, um, Go ahead and get on the um, on your on the um, uh, show your picture. That'd be great. Um, it, it, you know, I was we on the on the council and the executive committee for the Southern, the Southern Rising Rising. didn't know how this was going to go, um, and I'm so um, proud to see how awesome that this has gone. I mean, I, it's beyond my wildest imaginations. We've all worried about how virtual Zoom webinars are going to go, and this is just I think it's been absolutely spectacular. I've seen a lot of Zoom presentations where we haven't presented real research. Um, we've presented just invited lectures. I think the way that this was done was just absolutely uh, um, just very classy. The speakers were out completely on point and as were the uh, moderators and the digital moderators. So I'm, I'm really just proud to be part of the Southern family that's allowing us to be able to share some of this original research with us. Um, uh, I want to remind the um, uh, attendees to complete um, the webinar evaluation that, uh, that you'll receive by email and, uh, and uh, really specifically want to encourage all the Southern Thrasing members to attend the virtual STSA business meeting on Saturday, December the 12th at 9 a.m. Uh, one of the last things that I want to say is um, how proud um, I can say not only for myself, but also the executive committee. Um, and also the entire council uh, of three specific people who really um, drive 99.9% .9 of the ship for the Southern Thoracic, and that's Beth, Laura, and Rachel. Um, and so um, I'll take a moment at this point just to give everybody, for everybody to clap uh, on behalf of the, the, the three of them. So thank you. They're, they're really the drivers for this. We just kind of show up and, and, um, and, uh, and and for me, I'm specifically watching Shanda to see how many times she changes her glasses um, during during a webinar. Just like you know, sometimes I watch the academies and I see how many times you know uh, uh, somebody's going to change their dress. As Shanda, I'm I'm seeing how many times she's going to change her glasses. So um, 
I like it's that because he's trying to get the Ozer Abbott Award being I different. He's creating a whole new, uh, whole new thing. Um, Careful, guys. <laughs> so, she, I, oh my God, hold on. She's going to come back with a new set of glasses. Um, so uh, there you go. See, oh I, knew that, I knew that was going to be coming up. So um, uh, Jeff or Dan, um, Dan is a uh, upcoming president. Jeff as the council chair. Uh, any any comments as we kind of close up for the last couple of minutes? No, I, I, I think you know we only picked the the top six abstracts to, to present today, and I wish we would have done more. You know, we didn't know how this was going to be, and hopefully this will never happen again. But I think you know other meetings that we have and regional meetings and things that we'll be able to educate our colleagues, and I think this is a great avenue with the team doing that. I think everybody did a great job. Yeah, Jeff. Yeah, I, I, again, first like to echo your thanks to Beth and Laura and Rachel, who uh, are the glue that hold us all together. And Vino, I'd like to congratulate you for your leadership. We're all very much looking forward to hear your presidential address one year from now, hopefully in the same room where we could then have some wine that evening. And uh, with that, I guess we should wrap it up. And I'd like to thank all the attendees. Yeah, thank you very much, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you. Be safe. Thank you.